Plutonium, it turned out, requires a much more sophisticated design. I talk about this a bit in the text. I may come back to it uh, in a later lecture. But a plutonium bomb requires that you take that material and you compress it. Uh, the, the reason has to do with some pollutants that they could not easily get rid of in plutonium. Uh, pl pl plutonium 240, it turns out, tends to pre-detonate the bomb. It makes it go off before it's completely assembled. So it turns out the compression is necessary. Here's what you need to know. What I want you to know is that a plutonium bomb requires an implosion. What that means is, you can make an implosion work with the uranium bomb too. Let me show you a design of an implosion bomb. And a couple of interesting features about this bomb. It's round, of course. And, and the roundness um, is what you do for an implosion. What you want, an implosion means you, you surround this thing with explosives. So when the explosives go out, they also push this thing in and compress it. That's called an implosion. Very hard to do. Try squeezing a water balloon, you see the problem. You squeeze it here, it comes out between your fingers. So the implosion has to be exceedingly uniform, very difficult to do. This uses a more, this is a somewhat sophisticated advanced design, uses what are called explosive lenses. We'll talk more about lenses when we get to optics, but basically the idea is you trigger, you see there are 32 detonators. So you have to fire them all off simultaneously. That's hard to do. But with these shapes, these things that are, that are called the, the lenses, <coughs> What you do is you make the explosion go in just such a way that it comes to get together into a perfect sphere just as it's coming in. This is a tricky thing to do. I've seen the places in Los Alamos where they build these things. They have machines that grind the high explosive to make them just the right shape. You have to get them extremely uniform. How do you have someone, machinist, working with this high explosive to grind it just the right shape? What if it goes off? He's dead. So you just say, oh, take the risk. What they wound up doing is they had the machinist half a mile away working with a video camera, machining this thing remotely in order to machine the high explosives. This is not the sort of bomb a typical terrorist group is going to put together. You get a really high-tech country, such as, I don't know, the United States, Britain, France, Israel. Or you get a low-tech country that's willing to give up feeding its people in order to put all of its money into becoming a small high-tech sector on, on nuclear explosives, and, and you pay us, you know, get, get really top people and, you know, help everybody else, let them starve, so we're talking, of course, of North Korea, then you could do that too. So these, this is where you were, but a terrorist group isn't, isn't going to do this, in my opinion. This is too hard to do. So this is the most elaborate, accurate design I was able to find that's unclassified. The reason that I was able to show you this is simply that this was was not a U.S. design. This was a design that was drawn for the Senate by Khalid Hamza, who was the bomb designer for Saddam Hussein. He defected, I think, in 1995. I think that was when it was. He almost didn't get out of the country because the U.S. thought he was a fake. But he was the guy in charge of the nuclear bomb program in, uh, in Iraq in 1995. You, you can see why the U.S. intelligence agency drew the wrong conclusion that Saddam Hussein was deeply involved in this. He had done this in 1995 at a time when he claimed to be abiding by the treaty but wasn't allowing full inspections. He never did allow full inspections. That's why it came as a shock to many of us when there actually were no bombs or even components of bombs that we could find in Iraq because as recently as 1995, this chief bomb designer who defected actually knew a lot about the bomb design and they were doing tests. So, uh, give people a little bit of slack when they say that they mis were mistaken. There was a lot of reason to think there were bombs being designed there. There are two types of bombs. There's the plutonium bomb. Problem there is not getting the plutonium. Problem there is making the bomb out of it. Problem with the uranium bomb is getting the uranium. So let me say a few words about that. You start off with uranium, natural uranium, that you dig out of the ground. Natural uranium, it's actually quite abundant. Uh, in granite, it's typically a part per million of uranium. A part per million, how much is that? Well, if you have a cubic meter, a part per million is a cubic centimeter. 
So how do you get this uranium? As I said, it's, it's not hard to get the uranium. I mean, you could do it from granite. Nobody bothers. You go to uranium ores. But then what you get is natural uranium, which is uranium-238. Uranium-238 is 99.3%. And then the uranium-235, which is mixed in with it, is 0.7%. Is how do you... Now, if you keep them mixed, it will not work. The reason it won't work is very important. When the chain reaction starts and these neutrons fly off, most of the neutrons will be grabbed by the uranium-238. And when they do that, you don't get the fission. Actually, what happens when a neutron hits uranium-238 is an interesting thing. It turns to uranium-239. Uranium-239 decays. And then it decays again, and you're left with plutonium. So, a neutron on uranium-238 gives you plutonium-239. There are a couple of decays that take place in the, pro in the process, but that's what you get. This is how you get plutonium. You get plutonium by making it from uranium-238. If you want to extract the uranium-235, it's hard to do. Lawrence, after whom the Lawrence Berkeley Lab was named, came up with a way of doing this during World War II. He thought, and we'll talk, you know, this is, he used an electromagnetic method. The idea was you build a big tank, you vaporize your uranium, you ionize it so it has a charge, you run it through a magnetic field, and it turns out the uranium-235 will bend in the magnetic field a little more than the uranium-238. So here's the 235, here's the 238. So then you take this plate and you scrape off the uranium-235 and you do it again. He did this, was able to produce a little bit of pretty pure uranium-235. Did that here at Berkeley. This thing was, was not a cyclotron, which is what he got his Nobel Prize for. He had to come up with a name for it. So he decided he would honor the University of, Cali of California and call it a cal -utron, named after our university. The thing worked well, and so General Groves had dozens of these things built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where by 1945, summer of 1945, they had separated out enough uranium for one bomb, which they put into the Hiroshima bomb, they never tested it, and dropped it over Hiroshima, killing 50 to 150,000 people. Named after Cal. Take that, I don't know whether you're proud of that or ashamed. I don't care. That's the history. Um, at the same time, Enrico Fermi at Chicago was frantically trying to build something that became called a nuclear reactor. And that's what the, really mo most of this lecture is going to be on, to make plutonium. After the war, the calutrons were basically not good ways to make uranium. They started using different things. They cried gaseous diffusion. The real secret of gaseous diffusion was classified until recently. But the gaseous diffusion plants in Oak Ridge, Tennessee were huge. We, we, we produced enormous amounts of uranium with buildings that were a mile long. That's the size of these buildings. And there were gaseous diffusion. What you do there is you heat up the gas, you take uranium, mix it with fluorine, make uranium hexafluoride. You don't have to know these details, but you'll come across them in the news. They talk about, about North Korea, no, I guess it's Iraq, Iran, having uranium hexafluoride. And we don't even like them to have uranium hexafluoride. Uranium hexafluoride is a gas. You don't have to heat it up very much to have it into a gas. And then by running it through the magic material, it turns out that because the light elements move faster, thermal physics, right? The light things at the same temperature, the light ones move faster. You run them through this magic material, you need a material that doesn't corrode. Uranium, uranium hexafluoride is very corrosive. You need something that can stand this stuff. And they had just the right magic material to do that. Its name today is Teflon. It was the high-tech material of Oak Ridge that was used for uh, gaseous separation of uranium. The fact that it was used that way was kept highly classified. Eventually, the space program started using Teflon. 
And uh, the public caught up, oh, Teflon, isn't this great stuff? And there's still an urban legend out there that one of the technical results of the space program was the invention of Teflon. Well, it was invented actually before World War II, but its first big commercial use was to separate uranium. Using the fact that uranium-235 moves faster, and so it comes out the end first. <laughs>